Asha Davenport, CASBO CEO, and looking forward to uh, our time together, at, look, walking through our legislative wrap-up webinar. Uh, one of the things that we'll be doing is uh, sharing what took place during this legislative cycle, um, some of the implications of that from our experts here uh, that'll, that are joining us today, and also the importance of the work that's being done on the legislative front. I wanna emphasize that for a moment. I wanna remind you that each elected official is able to bring in 40 ideas, 40 bills during their session. And if you multiply that out by elected officials, that's 4,800 bills. So as you look at the work that we're gonna share in terms of this legislative wrap up, it's really important that when we storm the castle, if you will, or we head into the state to uh, suggest policies uh, to improve student outcomes, that we have you behind us um, in those advocacy efforts. So we're gonna talk more about how you get involved, but at this point, I wanna uh, turn it over to our panel of experts. From introductions, I wanna welcome Eric Dill, He's the CASBO president and also the assistant superintendent of business services at Carlsbad U uh, USD. Welcome, Eric. Next up is Mark Scheel. He is our legislative committee chair, and he is the deputy superintendent and chief business official at Santa Clara USD. Laura Lilly also joins our panel today. She's our legislative committee assistant chair, and she's the senior director of business services at Placer County Office of Education. And bringing up the, the team is Michelle Gill. She's CASBO's Director of Policy and Advocacy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the work you've done. And let's share those results. Michelle. Thank you, Tasha, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Michelle Gill. So I will just quickly review the agenda. Uh, just like how Tasha mentioned, we'll review key legislation, implications of it, our impact through advocacy, and then how to get involved, and then we'll close it up and wrap it up with looking ahead. So just starting with key legislation, uh, just a little background, CASBO had positions on 23 bills this year, and 18 of those bills actually went the way we advocated for. So a really good year, and we're excited to share our key legislation with everyone. And yes, let's get started with facilities and contracting. AB 247, first one we start off with. I think everyone is pretty familiar with this bill. It is assembly's proposal uh, for education finance for school facilities from kindergarten till four, grade 14. So also involving community colleges to this part. So initially uh, there were two very similar measures. One was assembly and then one was Senate. Assembly you can see is AB 247 by assembly member Muratsuchi. Um, on the other hand, for Senate was SB 28 by Senator Glazer. Um, the Senate version was for um, K through 16, so I was also including higher education uh, programs for CSUs and UCs. Uh, but CASBO, we really liked AB 247 and really focusing on the needs of our kindergarten through um, community college facilities and really emphasizing for the 10 billion bond that actually was Senate got their own version of a climate bond and then assembly was able to get their education facilities bond. Um, and I know Tasha also has been working on this uh, for the campaign for Prop 2 as well. Yes, and uh, it's received some major endorsements recently. The Los Angeles Times uh, has come out to endorse. Uh, CASBO will also be uh, endorsing this bill, so we will be getting something out soon. Um, you know, really important uh, that your voters understand the importance of, uh, of passing Prop 2 to provide matching funds for our facility needs, and also that they don't get confused between this bill and the over 250 local general obligation bonds. Those of you who are on the ballot need to make sure that your voters vote for both. Uh, vote for Prop 2 and then get all the way down to the bottom of the ballot and vote for your local measure as well. And in some cases, they might have an elementary ballot bond and, uh, and a high school bond plus the state bond to, to consider. And to add here, it, it's been quite some time since we've had a state bond measure passed. Uh, so the needs, the facility needs in all of our districts are greater than they've ever been. And while we know that at one point in time, there was money in last year's budget development, 
uh, four one-time funds from general fund to help our local school districts. Uh, that was stripped out of the final state budget and all of the eggs are in the proposition two basket. And um, we've had a recent meeting with uh, Department of Finance. And um, as of right now, there is no uh, plan B. Um, this, this is the focus point at this point in time and the importance of proposition two. Another facilities bill that Castle was happy to support was SB 956, uh, 956 by Senator Cortese. It's a design build contracts bill. Actually, the design build methodology for projects was uh, there was a sunset for it in 2025. So this bill removes that sunset and now uh, the design and the building team will work together collaboratively, saving money and time. So we're happy to support it and we're really happy to see that was signed as well. SB 1374 uh, by Senator Becker. It's a net energy metering bill. Uh, so what this bill does is, you know, if you have multi, uh, multiple units, um, you will have to, and if you have your own solar panels, you would be able to use your own energy rather than selling it, rather than selling and then buying it back for much more uh, of the cost than what was sold for. So we were supporting the bill. We were actually, uh, disappointed to see that was vetoed. And then Eric, if you can please add some more uh, information about this guy. Yeah, and, and looking into energy rates and tariffs and net energy meter, and we could spend uh, all hour talking about the complexities of that. Um, you know, I think we'll leave it to say that this is a bill that would have helped school districts if they had multiple meters on their school sites and one solar power generating facility. The problem is the CPUC and the investor-owned utilities, the IOUs, they treat us like any other commercial energy customer out there. And they fail to recognize that schools are different. And this was a bill to undo recent action at the CPUC that, that would help us and encourage us to continue to invest in solar projects. Um, unfortunately, uh, this bill got vetoed, but um, you know the good news is, is it did make it out of the legislature because in the past they have been unwilling to delve into territory that's overseen by the CPUC. Also, it's in, it's it's encouraging because we know that the IOUs invest a lot of money in the election campaigns of the legislators, uh, but they pass this anyway. So, um, you know, maybe this is the crack in the door that we're looking for, and this is something that we can uh, we can support in a future bill uh, that maybe it looks a little bit differently and looks to reform. And you know, we'll, maybe we'll do this again when we have a different governor. And I think the unfortunate thing behind this. Uh, Eric, is that um, while, unfortunately, this bill didn't get passed, the required infrastructure that we as school districts will continue to have to do based upon DSA rules um, and other statewide initiatives, that isn't going away. And so we are going to have to continue to invest in solar infrastructure um, based upon those uh, rules and regulations. And hopefully we can also secure those assurances in the future of generating the savings for our operating dollars. Yeah, so we get uh, all of the costs and none of the savings. Hooray. Sounds like a mandate. Okay, SB 937 by Senator Wiener, uh, development projects and fees and charges. So just a little background, this bill was gutted from its original form a week before the deadline for um, bills to be moving through the legislature towards the end of session. So we didn't really see it coming towards the very end. Uh, and of course, you know, in a very simplest form, I can break it down is that, you know, for this is for contractor uh, developer fees uh, that schools won't be able to receive uh, those that money till uh, certification of occupancy has is available. Um, so this bill is actually very dense. Um, there have been a lot of questions about it too, but please Eric, Mark and Laura, if you would like to share more and elaborate more on this bill. Well, one, uh, you know, we had a meeting with the governor's office and uh, you know, the folks on this uh, webinar were all part of that conversation in an effort to get this bill vetoed as well. 
And frankly, the governor's office saw this as a housing bill and not as a schools bill. And you know, we tried to make the case that it's not school districts that are standing in the way of affordable housing projects and that that fee is is not getting in the way. Um, but unfortunately, it, it, it sailed through. Um, you know, we'll, we'll say that the governor's office was was open to our comments and they described us as, as very earnest uh, in our opposition. But um, this is going to have lots of implications uh, for new projects that come in because the um, the fees that the developer will ultimately pay, and I'll say if they pay it, because if anybody who's talked to a, a contractor who's come into the front office to pay their fees, they're always looking for a way not to pay the fees. Uh, but those fees that they pay at the end of the project are what they would have paid at the beginning of the project. So we lose our buying power. We also lose our leverage uh, to get them to pay those fees before they get their their building permit. Um, and and I was um, cynical enough to say that they should have renamed this the Classroom Overcrowding Act of 2024 uh, because we will not get the funds to mitigate the impact of development until the end of the project for certain types of projects. So um, you know I'll I'll wrap up my comments to say uh, it's it's very confusing and you have to bounce around the government code to read all of the definitions. Um, we're currently working on a webinar that will help explain this uh, bill and the implications before it goes into effect and what the best practices will be to ensure that districts get their their development fees and i just coincidentally had a meeting with my city planning department uh, a few days ago and i brought this up at the end of our conversation and they're not happy about this bill either and so you know i think this this will be an opportunity for us to you know join arms with our cities uh in making sure that that we make the best uh, you know, that we do the best that we can uh, with 937 as we move forward. Next bill is AB 1851 by Assemblymember Holden. Um, this bill is about a pilot program for lead testing in schools. Initially, CASPO had concerns with the bill regarding implementation and cost, uh, but once we saw the amendments, that would just be a pilot program for six to 10 MEAs and there will be grants available for this program, that's when we moved our position to neutral. Uh, but the bill didn't make it out of Senate and it uh, just died throughout the policy procedure. Okay, so the next subject of bills is about curriculum and instruction. And we'll get started with AB 1871 by some member uh, It's about personal financial literacy for grades seven through 12. Um, this bill just adds a course for literacy, a financial literacy in seventh, grade seven through 12. Um, this bill idea came to us through our advocacy days. We visited his office. He really liked uh, Caspo's input in a lot of different subjects and asked us to support this bill. We're happy to support him and happy to see that it was signed. Yeah, and I, I think it, it's not surprising that CASPO would be supportive of a bill about financial literacy. Uh, so proud to be able to support this and to see it um, be signed. But we're also, um, we also acknowledge that for many school districts, this is going to be a challenge. Um, adding yet another course uh, that is going to have to be um, taken before graduation is potentially going to be an issue at some of our high schools throughout the nation. Um, or throughout the state, if you will, um, when you have a fixed work day and a fixed schedule already. And so that this will create another challenge um, on the graduation requirements. I'm thinking if they sing about their bank account, we can use Prop 28 money, right? And just count it as two electives in one. Sounds like arts to me. Back when I used to actually write checks, you know, there were always interesting designs on your personal check. So, you know, that's art. All righty. Um, next bill is AB 2268 by Samimura Suji um, about English language proficiency assessment. Um, so this bill would exempt uh, TK students from the English language proficiency assessment for California. Um, TIGA students are really young, so we want to make sure that no one's being misdiagnosed. Um, and we're happy to support this bill. It was an urgency clause, so it is in effect as soon as the school year started this year. Um, and it got signed right away due to its urgency clause. All right, 
So moving on to governance and accountability, um, will be SB 1315 by Senator Archuleta reporting requirements. Um, I'm really happy to share this is a co CASPO co-sponsored bill, got it signed, and I'm also going to, you know, bring Tasha on to share more behind the scenes work that CASPO has been doing and has been involved with. So Tasha, please share with us all the things that took place. Well, this, this one I'm just so proud of for CASBA for a number of reasons. One is that we this shows offense. We're able to introduce legislation that uh, addresses some of the pain points. And it's a first step for us, right? This is not the ultimate solution, is not that we get a report on all the reports. But uh, behind the scenes, what, you, what we saw was you know, the assessment of what it would take to do these reports and it was in coming to us in terms of like full-time staff to do this which really further indicated this is a problem the number of reporting requirements we have on our districts is problematic so i love that we were able to again to be an offense position introduce legislation and i also want to plant the seed that we continue to think about that and that you bring these pain points forward because we can introduce legislation. But specific to this, what um, I really enjoyed is working with other states. We have six other states in the country that are really evaluating the data requirements of their school districts to establish you know, a, a, a policy infrastructure, um, evaluation infrastructure, uh, so that we don't end up with competing reports, burdensome reports. Uh, and so we're really working closely to look at what those other states are doing. Some are as aggressive as their uh, governor uh, issuing an executive order to reduce the administrative burden by 25%. Interesting, but what if it's one report that really is miscellaneous and that gets cut off and that's your 25% and you still have these really uh, outlandish um, bureaucratic requirements. So we're going to take a look at what reporting is done uh, with the state, and then we will start to look for duplications, elimination, and the like. So that's part one. We also have a great partner with the chief consultant of the Assembly Education Committee, Tanya Lieberman. She is very passionate. Uh, first of all, she's very practical, a phenomenal resource to us, and uh, also uh, dislikes bureaucracy in terms of things that uh, are taking away from a district's ability to focus on a student by again, in this case, really um, overbearing requirements. So what we want to do, of course, is um, figure out uh, a, a set of reporting requirements that give uh, the state what it needs in terms of oversight and accountability, um, but again, uh, eliminate and reduce some of that uh, more burdensome. We're partnering with the Small School Districts Association to look at a subset of metrics that might be most applicable for just a small school. We're exploring uh, what I would just call outlier reporting. Um, if their districts have bet, had problems in, in ongoing problems in a particular area, they continue to report, and perhaps the rest of the districts don't. So this is um, this is problem solving at its best. I'm happy to be a part of this particular discussion, and this was a really big win for us. Yeah, I think we won the award for the most ironic bill that passed because we asked for a report on reports. And um, and I do want to praise Tasha uh, for bringing this idea forward um, to the association and working with those other states. And, you know, there were other ideas that that we saw where, you know, if a, if a new report is added, another one is taken away and, you know, looking at dupl uh, duplication and overlap. And, and then there's other states that say, if we're going to make you do this report, we're going to give you money to do it. So, you know, there's lots of ideas that are happening in other states, and that's the power of our CEO uh, networking with her peers and, and hearing what's going on across the country in an effort to reduce this. Because, you know, we all joked a few years ago about the pandemic and just the number of plans and reports that we do. And, and it just seems like we're getting more and more and more. And I, yeah, I think about how at the state level, we're worried about the return of categorical programs. And I'm old enough to remember uh, before LCFF and the revenue limit days when we had uh, we had dozens and dozens of categorical programs and just how big the instructional uh, services division was in the district because they had all of these people who were siloed and a lot of it was to handle the reporting requirements. Now we don't have as many categoricals, but, uh, but we have 
almost an equal number of, of plans and reports that we have to do. So um, again, this is first step. Uh, once the data comes in on uh, the number and the scope and the burden, then we're going to start targeting, okay, how can we solve this problem and introduce bills that will make it easier on all of us and 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 hopefully for the small school districts in, in particular. So thank you, Tasha. And for a little bit further irony on this bill, I would say that it was ironic that CDE was stating how many people they were going to need to do this report about reports, and which is what we've been all talking about before. And I think the only thing, unfortunately, I think the only thing missing out of this bill is that they didn't have to submit a planning document about how they were going to do the report about reports. Uh, but again, Tasha, I want to congratulate you and the team. Uh, this is um, this is a good step forward to hopefully reducing administrative burden for um, all California LEAs. Also, I wanted to mention as the county office of ed representative on this panel of we also understand that you you are often doing these reports for your small school district. So it's even more of a burden for those county offices who are providing services when you have to do all those reports. So, um, again, thanks, Tasha, for that, because it's it's a lot for us at county offices as well. Thank you. So moving on to the next bill, it's SB 1288 by Senator Becker. It's about AI working groups. So CDE, along with Superintendent of Public Instruction, will be creating a working group that will study AI uh, in education. Um, and um, by January 1st, 2027, they have to post the recommendations online for everyone to be seen. AB 2112 by Senator Muratsuchi, uh, ELOP, it's another working group bill um, doing a very similar thing to the previous bill that, you know, there would be a working group on just, you know, studying the development and recommendations um, for our expanded learning opportunities programs and how um, to have schools um, be ready for their funding by November 1st in 2025. Uh, this bill did not pass. It was supporting the bill, but just didn't get too much funding and appropriations. So that's why we didn't get it. Um, we didn't see it get out of it. Now, moving on to human resources. Uh, I know exactly what bill is next, and this has been very controversial. I think we all have you know, a lot of memories of just so much frustration from this bill. Um, AB 1699 was the same version of AB 2088 um, that we were also opposing last year. So AB 2088 um, by Assemblymember McCarty, same author as last year, it's about public posting vacancies. So the most simplest way how I can describe this bill is about um, you know, promoting classified uh, staff based on their seniority rather than skill set. Uh, just there were so many issues with this bill and, you know, CASPO uh, was opposing it last year and also opposing it this year. And, you know, really happy to see that the bill was vetoed. Uh, and we also post the veto message right here for everyone because we are really happy to see CASPO's influence in it. Um, you know, I will also ask Eric, Mark and Laura because uh, and Tasha, all of us were there with the meet, uh, for our meeting with the governor's team uh, for this bill. So, you know, and Laura was also here. So if Laura, uh, you want to share how you were able to. Yeah, I, I, I would love to share. And um, I guess really to celebrate what I felt like was just great teamwork on this bill on getting it vetoed. And I think really showed that we can move the needle and our input does matter. And this was a great one. Um, um, like Michelle said, we started with the ledge committee. We started with just an opposed position. And then, um, you know, the government relations team ensured that we were able to um, testify in opposition to the bill. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't think they heard our words at that moment, but we were then able to, they got us a meeting with the governor's office. Um, and so we could make sure that we could still share our concerns um, once it made it to his desk to sign. Um, during that meeting, we discussed that many LEAs had already bargained similar provisions in their agreements. And at that point, the governor's office asked us if we would provide them with some some samples. And so um, I went out to my out of my 16 districts, I found 14 in my county that had, you know, I could highlight the um, bargaining agreement language that sort of addressed some of the concerns of the author. 
And then we we see in the veto message that they you know they reference that bargaining agreements have already um, addressed this. So um, it was great to see that. And I think we're always hearing that legislators they love to hear stories of how this stuff impacts us at a, at the LEA level. And even more so, I feel like that data, if we can give them that data as CASBO, that's what we're good at. <laughs> we're good at the details. And the more we can give them that, I think we can, we can really help move the needle. And I think, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. I was just gonna say, I think an important point here is, is that we are not opposed to promoting from within. That is not what this opposition is about. The opposition to this bill was a requirement to promote based upon seniority um, without assuring that it was the best qualified candidate. Um, and in addition to that, the extreme and, and significant time constraints that were put on the filling of vacancies as well. And so that was what our um, opposition was about. And again, not we weren't opposed to promoting from within when the individual is the most qualified candidate. Um, but it was also that there were very significant time restrictions um, in a opposition to this bill that would have had an impact on our service uh, to supporting students. Yeah, you know, those of us uh, on this call, we started as classified bargaining unit employees. And so, you know, we worked our way up. And so we understand, um, you know, the value of classified employees. But, you know, one of the main constraints on this bill was uh, delaying the posting for all positions. And when you consider an entry level position, there are no internal candidates to promote up for an, for an entry level position. And also those entry level positions usually are the ones that have the most contact with students. So think about your instructional assistants, which are extremely difficult to hire right now. Bus drivers, also extremely difficult to hire right now. Uh, custodians uh, who are in the, the schools and classrooms and maintaining a safe environment. Um, Difficult to hire, also an entry level position, and then um, and then nutrition services workers. And you know, we made the point that you know, the longer it goes without us having those people, um, then that's an impact on our classrooms and on our students. And so that was that was part of our again what was called earnest uh, opposition uh, to this bill. And we're happy, um, you know, that we we got the veto last year. We got the veto this year. Um, you know, we won't be surprised if we see a very similar bill get introduced again uh, on this, um, you know, but we're going to stay on top of this because, you know, ultimately we want to do the thing that's going to get us, you know, as fully staffed as quickly as we can to provide services to students and also in a legally compliant way uh, when you consider the services to students with disabilities. So, you know, this was this was a great win for local flexibility. And yeah, we've all got it in either our merit rules or our bargaining agreements on those on those promotions. I pr we promoted over 30 classified staff members in my district last year um, without the need for that, without this bill telling us to do that. So next bill is AB 1997 by Assemblywoman McKenner. It's about teacher's retirement law. Uh, this bill is just a simple clarifying bill uh, and just redefines the definitions of a uh, few subjects. Because there's just been a lot of um, issues because the whole starts program is so dense. So there's been some overpayments or underpayments. So this clarifying bill will help with um, the whole program in general. Yeah, and Michelle, as the another time as my county office hat here, who because I do oversee retirement reporting for my county of, I think we are very cautiously optimistic that this these reporting changes and simplification will actually really be simplified <laughs> when it's done, and um, hopefully that the admin burden that you know, that gets reduced by these by the upcoming law in 2027, um, that hopefully that that offsets any additional contributions that we might have that could cost us more as it, as each district, but. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of educational organizations are supporting this bill and they asked CASPO for our input, our insight also, and we're happy to join them and see that this bill was signed. AB 2901 by Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry. It's about paid uh, parental leave for 14 weeks. Um, you know, just uh, want to share that you know, CASPO was opposing this bill uh, due to cost and staff shortage. Uh, we understand 
the reasoning behind this bill being introduced, uh, but the main reason for our concern opposition was uh, there was no funding along with this bill, there was no budget asked, and also we already have so much staff shortage that if we see our um, staff leave for 14 weeks, uh, that can be really um, create a lot of gaps for our students. Um, so, you know, uh, looking forward to seeing if there's any solutions and then if the bill is being introduced again, then CASPO will um, see how it leads us to next year and later. AB 2245 by Assembly Member um, Gurio. Um, this bill is about giving permanent status to ROCP um, um, employees. Um, so we are opposing this bill uh, because, you know, it's just giving cert, uh, the status of being permanent, but also so much of these kind of bills have been introduced, giving permanent status, uh, but very later on, the bill was amended to only being for single districts. Uh, there are about 10 or less single districts in California, so we do want to um, bring attention to that. Uh, but it's the president behind it, you know, just carving out different sections uh, to give permanent status. So we still oppose the bill, uh, but since it was amended, just bringing up to your attention that it is at a smaller scale than originally was. Yeah, the, last year this was introduced not only for these positions, but also for adult education uh, instructors. And, you know, the difficulty with it is that you have people in highly specialized, uh, you know, kind of single subject areas for uh, adult education or career technical education. And, you know, the need for that staff is driven by the enrollment in those programs. And it would just be difficult if we had, you know, some of these folks who traditionally work on an hourly basis um, to suddenly have the same status as um, as our permanent certificated employees and have to go through the layoff process. If suddenly, uh, you know, the welding class that they've taught, uh, there there isn't any enrollment and we would have to carry the, 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 the weight of that teacher um, with no students in the class. And if, if you see decline in an industry um, and still have to carry the teacher, that's problematic. You know, fortunately, as, as Michelle mentioned, there's there's only a few uh, ROCPs out there. Um, so this is very limited to them. But, you know, this was also a concern the year before and also for adult education uh, programs, which do uh, we do still have many of those across the state as well. So we'll keep our eye on whether this is now the, the crack in the door that's going to open the original bill to come back in a future session. And then um, AB 2557 by Assembly Woman Ortega is about contracts for special services and temporary help. Um, so this bill would have required each board of supervisors to post their contracts and related documents on their internet, including progress, objective, goals, and desired outcomes by July 1st, 2026. Um, so, you know, so a lot of our local schools and organizations work with their partners in the community. So this would have really put everyone's information, the progress online. So really opposed to about how this would have shown that we are working with the community members, but if a task takes longer, it'll be posted online. Uh, there was a lot of opposition on this bill, um, a lot of nonprofits, LEAs, because we want to make sure that things are done with our community partners. Um, so we were happy to see that this bill did not make it out of appropriations um, in the Senate side. Alrighty, AB 938 by Samir Muratsuchi. Um, so education finance, classified and certificated staff salaries. This bill actually is a two-year bill. Uh, we were working with the author last year. Last year we had concerns, uh, opposition, then moved to concerns, and then this big bill was held and made a two-year bill. Um, just right before um, the deadline for the legislature to move bills forward, this bill was amended. Um, to have salaries um, be posted with CDE. And I know Mark here and also our legislative committee worked very closely with the author's office for these amendments also. So Mark and Laura and Eric, if you'd like to share more background, please. Yeah, thank you. I would say that uh, we were pretty involved in this potential bill from the very beginning. Uh, the original version of the bill had 
many issues um, for the legislative committee and CASBO as a whole. Um, that would have required some very um, concerning requirements uh, and had some contained some intent language that we were opposed to. Um, through some back conversations, we understood the, the passion that was behind AB 938. And, um, and our governance team was able to get us a co uh, conversation with the author's office. Uh, we went in with some pretty lofty expectations. Um, you know, the first ask was just an outright oppose and strip the bill and, you know, stop moving forward. And we heard very quickly that um, that wasn't going to happen, that there was some version of this bill that was going to move forward. And so we then pivoted and shifted our focus to, okay, well, what kind of a bill could we um, at least not oppose and at least get to a neutral status of something that we could live with um, rather than the original version of the bill. And many of the asks that we desired were incorporated in those original early conversations. And really where we ended up was kind of what we were hoping for was, um, and we're, again, we, we co-sponsored a bill that talked about reducing reporting requirements. And so we acknowledge here that this actually requires more reporting under the J90 process, but it also is for a limited scope of a type of employee to um, allow us to have the true comparisons. Um, you know, bus drivers, most school districts have bus drivers, but we tried to get, uh, share with the author's office that in many of our school districts, what one school district calls a particular class of employee might be called something else in another district. And so we tried to find um, titles that were very uh, similar throughout the state among all school districts. And again, no intent language in regards to what happens next, um, but it does um, provide some additional reporting requirements under J90. And Eric and Laura, I don't know if you want to say anything else on this. Other notable human resources bills, um, AB 1927 by Assembly Member Kalanese is about Golden State's teacher grants program. So this bill would have extended the Golden State grants program um, for prospective CTE instructors that are credentialed. Um, you know, we supported the bill, but due to funding and not having appropriate funding, uh, it was held and died in assembly. Um, next bill is AB 3106 by Assembly Woman Chiavo. It's about COVID-19 protection leaves. Um, what this bill did was just, you know, you don't have to prove any or any kind of excuse, um, any kind of proof about COVID, but this will give you unlimited COVID leave. So what this bill did was actually protects education employees from coming to work, um, even though, you know, um, CDPH and CDC, everyone has said that Right now, it's safe after a few days of staying at home to come back, but this bill was taking us back to the peak of pandemic um, timeline. Um, so, of course, we opposed it, um, and also because this bill was really heavily funded, um, we didn't see any money in appropriations, so it died in assembly appropriations. Third bill is SB 1116 by Senator Portantino, uh, unemployment benefits for trade disputes. So for this bill would just restore eligibility for unemployment benefits for two weeks. If you are striking or anything, because, you know, based on last year, he introduced a very, very similar bill due to all the strikes that were taking place. And then also this bill he reintroduced this year for also the strikes that were taking place uh, for related to Hollywood this year. And Mark, Eric, and Laura, if you have any thoughts on this one, please feel free to share. Okay, yeah, well, we opposed it and happy to see that it did not make it out of Senate Labor Committee. Okay. Um, yes, so just some few more, a couple more other notable bills is for career technical workforce development is AB 2019 by Assembly Member Hoover. Uh, it's about early and middle college high schools and programs. So this program, uh, this bill was just differentiating the early and middle college high schools and then programs. Uh, we were neutral on this bill. Um, we just saw that it didn't make it out of Senate Appropriations Committee. Another bill was for public safety, um, SB 1026 by Senator Smallwood Cuevas. 
um, school safety, school security departments. Um, this bill was introduced early on and we brought it up to our legislative committee right away because what this bill was doing is your school board would decide uh, who you contract with and also what kind of weapons um, your school safety um, director and your school security services can have. Um, there were a lot of concerns we had with this bill. We also met with the author's office and found out that this was just her own idea. Uh, there weren't any sponsors, anyone. So there was something that she experienced personally. This bill, that's how this bill came along. Um, a lot of concerns, of course, we discussed um, that how so many different school districts have to contract with different um, security services and how this would cause so much confusion. Um, and that's why the bill died in very early stages. And just um, wrapping up some more notable bills is right here is AB 3216 uh, by Assembly Member Hoover. Um, this bill was actually uh, amended not too close, uh, not too close to the deadline. So we are this is about having schools require every five years to have a cell phone plan. Um, and, you know, Governor Newsom, the state of California also wants to move in direction where there is more um, regulation on cell phone usage in schools. Um, so Eric, Mark and Laura, just based on your experiences, what is taking place on school uh, campuses, if you'd like to share anything? I'll just say that my school board uh, adopted a plan in advance of this bill passing um, that restricts cell phone use across all grade levels, different uh, different levels of access for elementary, middle, and high. Um, and so we've started this school year, and since then we've met with all of our standing uh, feedback and stakeholder interest groups, and we've got nothing but positive feedback from our, our teachers association, from our parent group, and also we're hearing from kids as well um, that they are really in, uh, focusing more when they're in the classroom <laughs> and teachers are reporting that kids are actually talking to each other. Um, so, you know, it, it seems like, uh, you know, this is a good thing. And I'll say in my district, we've just pulled together a work group of various individuals to begin looking at AB 3216 and uh, determining how we are going to move forward uh, with compliance on this. Um, and maybe later I'll use my smartphone and call Eric to find out what they're doing. And this is the, the one of those problems that I always keep saying, you know, we didn't create this. We didn't buy the smartphones for kids. And when parents were coming to us saying, you need to do something about the smartphones. And we said, why do you give them, why do you give them smartphones? We didn't do that. Same with e-bikes and, you know, any number of things that parents give their kids and then they turn around and say, schools solve this problem that we've created. But, um, but yes, we've, we've partnered with the community and, and with all of our groups and, you know, it seems that we've got a positive result on this. And then the second bill is AB 2534 by Assembly Member Flora. It's about certificated employees, disclosure, and egregious misconduct. This bill was actually brought to us by Mark because uh, you know, it was amended pretty last minute. Uh, also, that seems to be the trend for a lot of these bills. Uh, but Mark, yes, if you'd like to elaborate on this bill and the implications of what this bill does. Yeah, I, I don't think CASBO would have problem with the intent here. And the intent is making sure that we, you know, if an employee has, as stated in the law, egregious misconduct or allegations of egregious misconduct, that the prospective employer should know about it. But what this requires, it has a pretty significant uh, change in the reporting requirements and, and the next steps. Uh, it now requires every certificate employee to disclose during the hiring process every LEA that they've worked for. And then on the part of the hiring school district, it requires the hiring school district to um, contact every one of those LEAs to determine if there is egregious misconduct or allegations of that the hiring school district should know about. So this is going to have an impact on the hiring process. It's going to lengthen the reference check process. Um, I've already started having conversations with our HR staff about how do we track the amount of time that it is 
um, taking in order to not only respond to requests, but also in our uh, contacting of LEAs in order to determine uh, compliance with this bill. So um, unfortunately, I think that this is going to elongate our hiring process of certificated employees. Again, we understand the impact of this. Uh, CASBO did not take a position on this. Um, as Michelle said, it got amended pretty late in the game when we became aware of it. Um, but now we're um, starting to evaluate the potential implications of it. Yeah, th I mean, this is an example of where, you know, we don't mind as much about the lengthening the hiring process because it's for very noble reasons. Um, and you know, the initial re reaction among our members was, oh, gosh, we're going to have to send out requests to all of these districts. And I said, no, no, no. The problem is we're going to be receiving requests from lots of districts, um, and that's going to create a, a burden on the staff as they're going back into paper files um, to be able to give a good faith response to the districts um, to see if you know the if that certificated employee ever was subject to an uh, investigation or adverse action. So um, all good reasons, uh, and we'll just have to track this um, you know going forward. Yes, and. AB 176, Education Finance um, Omnibus Trailer Bill. Just a little background, trailer bills just make technical changes uh, to the existing um, um, budget bills. So just really quickly, I'll highlight what it does. It, uh, firstly, it sets the timeline for reporting ELOP expenditures. So please, uh, there are timelines set for that because if not, then you have to forfeit all of your funds for that year for ELOP. Secondly, it proposes additional flexibilities for your universal preschool planning grants funds. Thirdly, there are technical changes to the attendance recovery program. Uh, and then also there are extensions to the emergency closure submission plan uh, to July 1st, 2026. And lastly, uh, for independent studies, uh, it is just the manner LEAs document students work product and um, time engaged in asynchronous instruction to hours or fraction of hours. Um, so those are the technical changes that were made, and AB 176 was also signed towards the very end of the deadline when Governor Newsom had to either veto or sign the bills. And then as we are wrapping things up, I just want to share about how our members can get involved. Um, this year we saw 551 calls to action being sent out by our members. Uh, we have 30% increase rate for these calls to actions. And thank you so much for those. These calls to action really do make a difference to the uh, to the all of the legislators um, and also the governor's team. Uh, you know, we had our campaigns for 1315, um, AB 2088, and SB 937. And again, thank you for being part of this advocacy. Looking ahead, yes. Um, so I will give this to Mark and Laura, uh, our chair and assistant chair for the legislative committee. Uh, we just met, so Mark and Laura, please share what we really discussed and decided just this past uh, two Fridays ago, yes. We just recently met the legislative committee, uh, got together along with our advocacy committee and had um, a lot of robust conversation about what our CASBO's budget priorities will be for this upcoming cycle. Um, as no surprise, the first bullet point has always been and probably always will be uh, continuing to fully fund the COLA, but we've modified that this year. Um, and that is to also include the appropriate funding for the TK initiative of the one to 10 staffing ratio, students, uh, staff to student ratio. So we want to make sure that that is also included in the LCFF funding formula as we move forward, recognizing that that is a requirement that the state uh, has mandated on all school districts, and we need to see the appropriate amount of funding for that. Uh, the second is, again, we have always continued uh, over the last several years, um, continued to advocate for an increase in special education uh, funding for our, our various special education programs. So no surprise there that that is added. Um, we are um, adding to that this year and the focus of the Proposition 2, uh, continuing to support Proposition 2 and then asking the governor to appropriate uh, the necessary funding for the TK through 12 projects. And last and, and certainly not least is we look forward to uh, FICMAT's report 
uh, that will be released sometime in February about AB 218. And then working together towards a solution for the fiscal impact of AB 218 on all of our school districts. And so those are our top four budget priorities for the upcoming year. Uh, Laura and Eric, anything you want to add to that? I would just add that I think what's great about our legislative committee is that we really all come from very different backgrounds in all of our districts, or in my case, a county office look very different, but I feel like these four priorities, I feel like it, it impacted all of us equally. And I think we could all get behind all four of these. And um, that is what's great about, about the committee and, and what we're able to do in that way. Yeah, and if I can just add a little bit more on AB 218, because as I look at the participant list, you know, without us ex explaining what this is, um, you might not know, but you know, this was the um, the bill that was eventually signed by the governor that opens up the statute of limitations uh, for survivors of sexual abuse and molestation to file claims. Um, it, we've been looking for a financial reform on this bill because the costs of insurance and judgments have been uh, just so uh, monumental and in some cases you know leading to disaster for school districts when they're subject to one of these uh, these claims and uh, and the judgment is above their insurance limits. Um, so you know we uh, it, this is another one where we completely understand um, the reasoning behind the bill and we're not looking for any kind of repeal or or trying to skirt justice for victims um, but recognizing you know that there is a extreme financial impact and Casbo did some research last year and found that 25 cents of every new LCFF dollar went towards paying an assessment uh, for past claims. And so, you know, in a very low COLA year, uh, when we're struggling to pay for everything else we do, um, you know, a quarter of that went to old claims, and that doesn't even recognize the cost of insurance going forward. So FICMAT is doing a study, and they're going to be um, uh, recommending a number of actions um, that the legislature could consider in order to uh, provide funding or relief to districts, because certainly we don't want the state to be issuing state loans and taking over school districts because of a judgment. AB 1200 was not set up to take over well-managed school districts. It was set up to take over districts um, who were fiscally irresponsible, and that's not the case here. And uh, and if we find ourselves where suddenly, um, you know, the state is taking over districts because they can't afford um, to pay a judgment and make payroll at the same time, that that is uh, a, an unintended consequence of that bill. So. Uh, we are going to be poised uh, to jump in as soon as that report comes out, partner with the legislature uh, in order to uh, introduce um, a bill or co-sponsor or just support uh, a reform that will help school districts manage the cost of this going forward. And also just what's next is the November general election. Um, that's the biggest one. And then for federal updates, November 5th, there will be a pretty special date. Um, for our state also, there will be statewide elections too. So we'll be seeing a lot of veteran members leaving, our senators and assembly members, and a lot of new members coming in. Um, so this also gives CASBO an opportunity to educate them. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. And just a reminder on the ballot is um, Proposition 2, the K-12 through um, and Community Colleges Facilities Bond. So please, uh, you know, just take a look and hopefully we see the Prop 2 pass. Just to wrap things up, thank you everyone. Uh, all of information is here. So please reach out if you have any questions and Tasha, if you'd like to close us off. No, I just want to thank you for all the successes this year. Uh, obviously, your voice matters. We can't like, you know, charge the hill and look back and not have uh, all of the insight and support. So thank you for being here today. Have a fantastic weekend. And we look forward to your advocacy with us uh, in the year ahead. Thank you.